This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Palm Jig is here. Uh, that's the, the book. Um, you can say what you like within reason, but um, the interest really in, in, in these conversations is often to um, obviously hear a little bit about and people can read the book clearly you know, if they haven't got it I'm sure they'll buy one um, so you, you might want to touch on what's in the book but perhaps yeah. a bit about the process about why you write why you wrote it uh, you know stuff mm. around it is kind of interesting to sort of historical in, in where it fits in the kind of uh, oh, you know uh, pantheon of uh, classic uh, memoirs of Labour ministers um, the classic kind of genre, of course, is from Peterhead to Parliament, which, uh, and, uh, you know, there is a sort of alliterative P1 that we've talked about before, we, which, uh, mm. <laughs> so, but, um, so, you know, that's, the, the interest in, in Labour history terms is that there's, you know, there's quite a genre of these kind of books, um, but not uh, that many. This one's a bit different to the, uh, to yes, the, indeed, to absolutely, the other, uh, it is a bit different to, uh, the, the, a lot of the ones that were familiar to Labour historians, um, so you might want to say uh, a bit about that yeah. as well. So, Palmji. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. It's and it's nice to have it kind of like an an intimate environment to actually have a proper conversation about the book, the process, how it came about, the thinking behind it, and uh, and also a little bit about the content as well, which I think you might be uh, quite interested in. Now, I was the member of Parliament for Gloucester from 2001 to 2010, but my political race isn't just about that period in time, um, because as events happen during the course of your life, it makes you think about other things that happened along the way, little triggers in history that set you in one direction rather than in another, whether it was you know, stuff that my parents did or the people I met, the trade union I worked for and stuff like that. But in terms of the actual process of writing it, I started writing it, where are we now? It's, um, it's June 2015, so it would have been the spring of last year. And there were a set of events that kind of kicked that off as well. The book starts, chapter one actually starts with the end of the story really, because there's some stuff I wanted to unburn, get off my chest at the very beginning. Uh, and I suppose that was the kind of newsworthy stuff. Um, it's called The Pig's Head. Um, in December of 2010, we just lost in Gloucester. Uh, I'm spelling the end of my nine years as a member of Parliament. Three of these lovely things at home during the course of that period of time. Uh, as I said, that was from the Department of Communities and Local Government, one from the Department of Education, and one from the a black one from the Whips Office. Um, and a decade, over a decade of very much making Gloucester my my home. Um, starting off as a young single man and then ended up you know married with two kids both born locally and, and working hard but anyway there we were December 2010 one day and there's a knock on the door I remember telling Denise about this actually just after it happened I'd spent a period of time after May of 2010 May 2010 obviously was the last general election before the one we had just a few weeks ago um, my wife lost her job a week before polling day, which looking back was quite funny, you know, she, she was quite traumatised by it, uh, but there was a lot of jobs going at the time, she was a family lawyer and it was a difficult time for the economy. I said, well, I'd better win then, hadn't I? And we thought maybe I would. We lost. So I started working with these guys down at Prospect, uh, not for the first time in my life, and I was doing the journey to and fro from London to Gloucester back a few days in London back at home work from home on a Friday and it was a lot of time to think and chew things over not an easy time and then just as we think we're getting ourselves back on our feet my wife's back in work knock on the door and we have this tradition in our family it's a very Indian thing where and we do it every morning of every week you can't start the day without a pot of Indian chai you know proper tea boiled in a pan of water with tea bags and everything thrown in, in the melting pot, simmering, and it was simmering away. I can almost smell it now. And I thought, Sunday morning, 
I do breakfast for the kids who are at the time ooh, uh, four and one. Why still in bed? People don't knock on your door unless there's trouble, really, when you're an MP. I went to the door and there was a, a friendly looking lady. I think when you're, when you're in politics, you become so much more aware of people's facial expressions. Is this person gonna smile at me if I smile at them? Is it, is it a friendly kind of person or not? And it was a friendly face, probably a woman in her 50s, but looking more than a bit jittery, upset, almost in tears. And I remember her saying, they've left something horrible for you over there behind your car. And she had a dog and it was pulling her body away from her. And I don't remember her leaving, but I do remember having a friendly face and going her own way and, and me putting on my trainers and going outside. My wife heard the doorbell, she was going to come down to look after the kids while they were chit-chatting with their grandparents on the phone. So I went out there, uh, looked behind one of our cars in the drive, and there's a severed pig's head lying in the front drive. And how would you feel if there's a pig's head lying in your front drive? Well, probably not how you'd expect to feel. It was almost a kind of inquisitive feeling. I thought, there's, there's no mistaking it. It's quite, quite a sight. You can't take your eyes off it when you see it. So I went down, got closer, and I got a look at it. And its eyes were still there in place. And it was, you know, it's an extraordinary thing to find. Not what you expect on a Sunday morning when you drive. Now we were looking at grainy um, CCTV footage because our house had to have all of those security measures in place, not least because we were getting more and more incidents around the house. Broken windows, uh, damage to fences, car window smash, that kind of stuff, or people turning up in the middle of the night, which would happen quite a lot when you're, when you're the MP. Didn't buy in the best location. It was right in the middle of a main road, so that's right, in that respect. But they'd actually left it on top of our cars. So it would have been they hadn't been so inept at doing what they were doing and he actually rolled off <laughs> and obviously they must have thought I was a Muslim I'm actually a Sikh um, so you know we do eat pork and stuff sausages and stuff like that but you know the naivety of these people as Alan Johnson describes in some detail in in the foreword to the book but thankfully it rolled off because otherwise it would have been the first thing that my kids would have seen and my response to that was oh my goodness uh, quick, let's get it removed, called the police, they came and did their stuff and they sent all of the people in, you know, the white coats, the lab coats, the photographers, a police car, a motor, they really got carried away and I thought, look, I don't want this in the local paper because I've had nine really good years as an MP, I think I've got a really, really good record, as good as anybody, I'd like to think better than anybody, I don't want to be remembered as, you know, someone different in some way. Uh, who was treated in as a foreigner, you know, in his own constituency, or what was his constituency. Uh, so I got the police to stop doing their door-to-door. -door. Um, they still did their visits to the abattoirs and stuff, trying to find out where it had come from. But life moved on until about um, a couple of years later, I had an email from an MP called Natasha Engel, who said, we're doing a bit of research in Parliament about how people get treated in election times, particularly people from different kind of faiths and races, would you be willing to come and give evidence? So I wrote up a few things that happened along the way. And it's funny the things that come to mind. There was an article, and there's a chapter on it in there called The Offending Article, written by a local journalist called Hugh Worsnip. The week after I was selected as Labour's candidate for Gloucester, which was a bit of a shock to the system, not least for myself, you know, it was a long way from home, I'm a West London boy. There I was in, in Gloucester, the first seat I'd gone for, beating 100 people to get selected, including some fairly big players. Um, and the local newspaper wrote an article, and you can read it word for word in there, it's a relatively short, four or 500 word article, um, and which says, the people of Gloucester haven't reached a sufficiently advanced state of consciousness to accept a foreigner as their local MP. Now, you've got to be sanguine about these things. As a foreigner, I assume they meant someone from West London, you know. Um, but there I was, 28 years old, a long way from home, and all of a sudden I'm caught in the middle of this kind of race storm that was brewing back in 2000 because they said 
the Labour Party needed to get rid of me because they, the party made the same mistake as the Tories had when they selected a fellow called John Taylor John. for Cheltenham yeah. down the road yeah. in the neighbouring seat. So I wrote about that article. I wrote about an incident that had happened when we were campaigning uh, in the run-up to my first election um, when a Tory councillor had shouted to our campaigners, you know, my team, Oi, I bet your boy's uh, granddad wasn't in Dunkirk. Little things like that that shouldn't really matter because you face a lot of crap, quite frankly, as an MP. But things like that did get under my skin, not least because my grandfather had a beard and a turban and was in the Royal Bengal Engineers and was fighting in Burma for king and country in the Second World War. Um, so I talked about that and I talked about the, the campaign for the Conservative candidate, which was very much vote local, born and bred. OK, that's a fair message, but you kind of see where they're coming from. It's like, well, the other guy isn't local, born and bred, something a bit unworldly or different about him. And then I also wrote a bit about the pig's head. They said, Natasha got in touch and said, well, there's a few of us, there's me, there's David Lammy, there's a, there's a group of all party MPs. We've seen your evidence, uh, your written evidence. Would you come into the house and give evidence? And I thought, well, I haven't done that in a while. That'd be quite nice. So uh, I went in, it was 2012, and I gave evidence and uh, some shocking stuff. The guy next to me was a... Uh, a Tory MP for Ilford, who's Jewish, and talked about the death threats he's had as a, as a Jew and the security measures they'd had to put uh, up around his house. It was an extraordinary story. And they, then it was my turn, and I said a bit about, you know, local born and bred, the local newspaper, and they were pretty shocked by that. Um, and then I said, uh, at the end, uh, I said, oh, yeah, and then there was the pig's head uh, left on the drive. And I looked at their faces. And the look of sheer horror and shock. Um, and it was in the Sunday Times that week. Um, and a few of the newspapers had picked up on it, um, including the press, someone from the Press Complaints Commission was wanted to talk about local newspapers. It was all kind of stuff, little bubble of stuff about it. But I kind of like went back into my hole again for a bit. And I thought, well, am I really comfortable with this stuff being out in the public domain about me and race? And then a number of MPs and parliamentary candidates got in touch with me as well, saying, well, you've talked about this stuff. You didn't feel that you could for a decade as a parliamentarian because as an MP, you don't want to be seen as different from your constituents. And you want to be strong. And you don't want to be a moaner or a whinger. So by talking about this stuff, all these other people started to come through who were talking to me, saying, well, I can't say that stuff, so, but I'm so glad that you did. Um, so come last year I thought well maybe I'm ready now to get that story out in my own words about the pig's head not as a victim but as someone who's got control of his life again and talk about some of those other things but also I did not want this to be a depressing book about race okay it's called my political race that is the main chapter uh, at, the, at the outset it's the one that the Independent wanted to do a big piece on. It's the one that the Sunday Times wanted to do a big piece on and Sky. And But then it opens the door and gets to talk about some of the funny stuff, the good stuff, the, um, the stuff that began long before I came into politics as well. Because I wanted to talk about the early days. My political race kind of begins in 1962 when my father came to this country with two quid in his pocket, escaping abject poverty in the Punjab. Um, he and my mother were betrothed at the, at, the, at the age of 11 and 16. They'd never met each other before until he arrived here at the age of 18, 65, three years later, uh, three or four years later, he, he called for mum to come over to the country. She was like 17, came over on a flight, and I said, goodness me, this is kind of like blind date gone mad, Dad, isn't it? Can you imagine it? It's like the ultimate. So, this is a woman you've never met before in your life. My grandfather did the kind of arrangement, who liked whiskey or two as well, from, from a mate of his in the army. My father's uh, father. Uh, my father's father. My father's father. Um, now, you'll see the pictures in there. Mum and Dad are actually very, very good-looking couple. 
and uh, he, uh, he, he was quite relieved when he picked her up from the airport. But within days of that, they were married in a little house in Townsend Rose with a small traditional Sikh ceremony. They lived cheek by jowl to everybody else in that community. When he came here in 62 with a beard and a turban, he went out on the South Hall Broadway, Broadway and it was entirely white back in those days. Can you imagine that South Hall Broadway now? It's like the biggest Punjabi community outside of the Punjab. Uh, back then it was very different. And he remembers a little five-year-old kid running up to him and seeing his beard and turban, turning heel, crying and running off to his parents. Now that's not racism, that's fear of the unknown is what that is. But what the first thing dad did the week he got here was shave his beard and cut his hair. And he said, everybody, I'm sorry for beard fans in the room, you know, this is, <laughs> but they were all doing it um, to blend in, yeah. to be able to get work. He's actually grown his beard back very recently, actually, uh, my dad has, but <laughs> not just as a tribute to the Beard Liberation Front. But um, um, so a whole generation of them were doing that. But the, I was then born as the youngest of three. And by then, mum had become, well, she was doing the only job she was qualified to do. She was a cleaner, cleaning the toilets at Hillingdon Hospital. And as a cleaner at Hillingdon Hospital, all of the cleaners were from a similar background. You don't get a shift change of one group of Asian women going, another group of Asian women coming. Mum had three words of English, which were, you do that, to begin with. Uh, if she got any racial abuse, which was quite common back, back in those days, it usually was you know, phrases like, uh, you've come here and nick our jobs. And she could say, you do that then, and thrust a mop at them. And that's about all she could do. But she soon got noticed by a regional uh, Unison official, NUPI back then, National Union of Public Officials, young firebrand fella called Bernie Grant, who went on to become not just a relative of yours, but the MP for um, Tottenham many years, many years later. Mum used to act as his interpreter with all these Asian women. Um, Bernie and others said to my mum, well look, we need people like you uh, to be you know, our shop stewards because you, you like the other people doing the same, same kind of role. You can talk to them. She, she, uh, she said, no, 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 not for me. I'm not going to do it. They said, well, if we send you on a course to be able to read and write enough English, will you do it then? And she said, OK. So one of my first kind of political memories of my life, and I write about this, we go to school from the age of five, is with these little gold pens with Nupi written on them, and these little pens with Nupi written on them, and they're like little badges of honour. Didn't know what it meant, but that was kind of my first and early indoctrination into kind of politics, certainly the trade union movement. But if you think of those times that I was growing up in Southall and Hayes and on that border, um, Beresford Road, at the end of Beresford Road, Southall Broadway, was a pub on a hill called the Hambra Tavern, which was burnt down, burnt down. 79, was it 79 or 77? It's in the book. It was in the South Hall Rights. It was just after the death or murder of Blair Peach. You could almost have read the book already. But all that was happening. All that was happening around the time I was born. I didn't really realise that until. Did Brunwick have any impact on it? Not so much, no. But these were in my neighbourhood, you see. Well, I'm, I'm 43 now, so I was born in 71, so it was a similar kind of time, it was a similar kind of time. But I was well aware of this because it was in my neighbourhood. Um, and I remember looking out of our bedroom window, I'd seen the smoke come up, and by then, everybody in the phone was ringing, obviously no mobiles back in the day, they were all ringing each other, and through the grapevine, the skinheads had come to the Hambra Tavern. Lock up your kids, everybody stay in, don't go out, the skinheads are here. Because they had a band called the four skins, you couldn't make it up, could you? But they were uh, playing in, in the Hambra Tavern, they burnt the pub down, and then you had the skinheads, in the coaches at the pub at the top of the hill. And either side of them, if you were at the bottom of the Hay Southall Bridge, from the Asian community, you look up, you see a phalanx of the Met Police standing between you, looking down on you, with behind them the skinheads. However undesirable that 
that message, but it was the one that kind of came across to the community. It's you against us. The whole place was torn up that night, and I, I had family members who were arrested. My my uncle, who still maintains to this day, he was entirely innocent and didn't do anything wrong. But I write about that that experience, and then I go on to talk about. Uh, I was I was at a Labour constituency GC the other night. And they just had this big debate about the election and what happened and how awful it all was. There's a chapter, it's quite a short one, but it called, it's called Long Roads to Victory because I move on from the pig's head very quickly to mum and dad's early days and then my youth and the chapter called Long Roads to Victory, which is a funny chapter, really. And it's about 1980, so it may not have been very funny, in fact, but the funny things that happened on the road to 1997. Uh, the longest suicide note in history, as the Labour Manifesto was nicknamed uh, in the wrap to 1983. My own experiences as a schoolboy in a John Craven's school's election in, in our constituency in Hayes at the time, where despite the fact the country turned blue, because I had enough Smarties in my pocket, we managed to win in Hayes that night. But then, going on to knock on doors for our candidate in 1992, and looking at the exit polls, very similar to this year, uh, knocking on doors in Hayes and knowing we were going to win, seeing the first exit poll saying, OK, Labour's going to be the biggest party in our own parliament and being disappointed. And that's soon changing as the results started to come in. Going to bed thinking, well, at least we've won in my patch tonight, waking up the following morning and we lost by 43 votes in Hayes and Harlington. Um, and the feeling of, my goodness, never again, of wanting to do something about it, becoming a young organiser working for the Labour Party, which in, ex in itself was an extraordinary experience for me as a young man, because I went back to working in the patch that I grew up in, in Southall, looking after Steve Pound, Clive Soley, and Piara Cabra, who was the first ever Indian origin member of parliament. He did that by recruiting 5,000 people to the Labour Party, deselecting Sidney Bidwell. Uh, now, he was an extraordinary fellow, Piara. He was about that tall. And people lived in fear of him. I remember being told by Terry Ashton, the General Secretary of the London Labour Party, goes, in the run-up to the 97 election, he said, look, you've got three clear tasks here. Whatever you do, keep South all out of the newspapers and it's 5,000 members, will you? You're a local boy after all, you speak the lingo. I said, yeah, okay, Terry, you can leave that to me, I'll do that. Clive Soley, no problem, that'll be a cinch. Look after them, make sure they win, yeah. He goes, and your other task is Steve Pound, Ealing North. Just keep him out of trouble, won't you? Uh, well, one out of three is not bad, I suppose. <laughs> <Can> I? <laughs> so... And, and with Piara, I remember talking to him and saying, look, the General Secretary of the London Labour Party, Terry just said to me, let's just, let's just try not to get anything in the newspapers around Southall. Let's leave it to the key seats, the marginals. He said, but I'm dear, you can trust me. Don't worry, I know your dad and your granddad and probably your great granddad as well. And he did because, you know, from the homeland, they were all well linked. I thought, OK, well, he'll behave himself. First week, story, front page of the Ealing Gazette. Local MP condemns opponents as bastards and idiots. Front page of local newspaper. So I got the general secretary ringing me up saying, for God's sakes, what's going on? Get a grip of this man. I said, Piara, look, you know, party's got to be disciplined. General election in a few months' time. She said, it won't happen again. Trust me, trust me. Two weeks later, local MP, front page of the Ealing Gazette. India should nuke Pakistan. So that's what I was <laughs> up against with these people. But we did ever so well, you know, and I, and I write about that wonderful time and the huge learning curve and the people you meet and some funny stories as well about the 1997 election campaign. But by then, I was getting itchy feet and I wanted to have a crack myself. And I talk about, as a young man, throwing in for the seat in Gloucester. See, I had no real likelihood of getting and when I started to win all those nominations getting a phone call from someone in the Labour Party saying okay you've had your fun um, now let the serious ones get on and do it um, 
and there was always something hovering in the air about this is the seat Labour needs for an overall majority of one. Peter Mandelson used to do this presentation with a picture of Gloucester Cathedral saying that's what victory looks like. But it started to dawn on me, this is the seat Labour needs for an overall majority of one and people were starting to worry that if someone like me was the candidate for that area, could we lose that kind of key barometer seat? And I was just about, I was on the verge of pulling out of the selection because, well, I was young, I was naive, I was easily pushed around as well. And then I, I thought to myself, lots of people from the local party were ringing me, I'd won so many nominations. I thought, well, to hell with it. It's a local party and the members actually decide who the candidate's going to be. So I went back, I went to the hustings, I did my speech, and there's a chapter about the count and the nerves and how difficult it all was, um, but I won. I won that night, and I'll never forget one of um, our members coming up to me and saying, congratulations, um, you were the best candidate. You were the best candidate, simple as that. Uh, and I'd like to be Baroness Jan Royal, one of the best thing that ever happened to her career because she's a baroness now and became the leader of the Lords, the Labour Party. Um, the leader of the local council who'd been the candidate before, the PA to the retiring MP. And I thought, well, thanks very much, really appreciate it. He goes, no, 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 I didn't vote for you because I think we'll lose the seat because you're the wrong colour for this patch. But you were the best candidate. <laughs> so, you know, it was difficult from the start. And I write about some of the barriers, you know, there were people in the party that used to call me, me, Keith, they used to call me a trot back in those days, a trot. Mm. Um, now I've been called everything from a trot to an Uber, Uber Blairite, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm neither of those things, <laughs> I'm neither of those things. But I do, there's a theme in the book about if you stand out and if you're different, not about race or faith or colour of skin, but a lot of it's about class, a lot of it's about where you went to school, where I went to school, it'd be okay for me to say Hana at the end of every sentence, which is Punjabi for you know, but it's not okay to say, you know, it's perfectly okay to say you know, but it's not okay to say Hana, you know, these people are no different or no less intelligent, but if you're not from the same kind of school as people from the political village, or you didn't have similar shared experience um, through student politics, or a special advisor working for an MP, stuff like that, you are different. And like in life, recre actually kind of recruits like, whether it's the trade union movement, whether it's the barons of industry, whether it's boards. And that's a big issue to this day, uh, to my mind in politics as well. So I write about that, but I also write about, I think, um, things that people who aren't interested in politics will find interesting and fun and in a light way which I hope is really easy to read because it isn't a traditional political biography. In fact, one of my favourite chapters in there, something I've waited a long long time to write, I um, was very newly elected and I got an invitation to Buckingham Palace, I'd never been before, you know the story Denise because um, there were letters from the trade union into, into, from, from Leslie I remember reading in the Guardian at the time saying how appalled he was by the Duke of Edinburgh I met the Duke of Edinburgh I met the Queen that night um, the Duke of Edinburgh was working the room and he it was me, I think it was Steve Pound um, oh goodness me, Wayne David and Sedgemore Sedgemore, remember Brian Sedgemore mm. Brian Sedgemore was trouble with a capital S, he really was, because Brian Sedgemore used to have his own piece in Private Eye, he used to write under a pseudonym, mm. you know, not under his real name. So when the Prince came over and uh, was saying hello, and said, oh, so what did you do before, uh, he said to me, a trifle young, what did you do before, uh, before you were an MP then? And I said, I worked for a trade union, uh, and he said, so you didn't do very much then? <laughs> um, I thought, yeah, very funny. And he's got, he's got a glint in his eye. I thought, well, I'll keep this game going then. I said, so what did you do before you married the Queen? Um, to which he said, um, and, and the rest of it was quite disputed. Now, this same night, I'm in the, buck I'm in the palace, uh, but in the house, the Tories are having a huge punch-up over 
gay marriage, gay adoption actually is what it was actually. Ian Duncan Smith was leader and he'd, and he'd set a three line whip for them to vote against him. I don't know whether you recall this if you're a historian of politics, but that night Portillo was on the back benches and attacked IDS. So the front page of The Guardian the following day was, one of the headlines was what IDS had said, the Tory party must unite or die. And directly below that was MPs agog, was it one finger or two? Because after I'd said to the Duke of Edinburgh, so what did you do before you married the Queen? According to, I'm sure it was Brian Sedgemore, who got this out to the world's media within about 30 seconds of it happening, uh, he'd given me the V sign and said I was in the Navy for 12 years, so there. <laughs> now I played it down and said it was a chiding kind of, you know, I was in the, I was in the Navy, so there. And then he walked off. But every newspaper in the sun by then was running kind of stories about all of the things that the Duke of Edinburgh had done in his life and all of the, the faux pas, everything from, uh, you know, they love eating dogs for the anorexic next to all, all of the, the dark things he'd come up with. And it was in, I was getting emails from friends in places like Peru traveling saying, guess what I've just read in my local newspaper. <laughs> and I just hid in, in my office for a few days because I was quite embarrassed about it. You and Young, it was actually the poor old Jew that got the kicking from it. But I maintained throughout my time, it was, one, it was a playful wag. Uh, but I write up the true story in the book for the first time, uh, which is actually he did give me the V sign. Um, but it was very funny. Um, and I hope that people who read the book enjoy it, but at the same time, see both the serious sides of politics and what I'm trying to say, everything from the pig's head to that first moment in the chamber as a new MP when I got shouted at and asked where the hell did I think I was going because somebody must have assumed I was you know, a, a researcher that was wandering around the chamber on his own and pulling out my little green and white badge and looking at a rather stunned security guy and saying to him, well, I must be an MP. When really I, what, I, what I wanted to say was there's a line from a film called um, 48 Hours with Eddie Murphy which says, I'm your worst nightmare. I'm a black man with a badge. I'm paraphrasing because uh, uh, the, <laughs> the speaker's on. <laughs> but, uh, because you have to make light of these things. Um, and it's right too, and I do in the book, but I also talk about the serious stuff as well because if Parliament was more like our country, more representative of the people it seeks to represent, it would be a very different Parliament. And people will tell you things changed markedly, even at this general election. Well, it did. We went from about 27 ethnic minority MPs to about 40-ish. Mm. But if it was representative society, there would be about 95, 100-ish, you know, about 15% of society. It's dribbling along slowly 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 and frankly that's not good enough and um, and I say so and I write about it and I think uh, if in life the trade union movement the private sector boards the judiciary um, if there was a level playing field everywhere like would recruit like and we would be more like the rest of society so that's my book anyway and um, I hope you think about perhaps buying one if you haven't got one already uh, or going to a library or whatever and reading it and enjoying it. Thank you Keith.